Thank you, Glenn, and hi, everybody. My name's Don, and I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> and thank every one of you for being here, and particularly the folks who are counting days. Um, my sobriety date's April the 9th of 1981. And I so remember, or remember so well, when I was counting days that it just didn't seem that people who had been sober a long time really had alcoholism anymore. And I would, I remember them saying things like, oh, I'm just a drink away from a drunk. And I'd think, oh, give me a break. <laughs> You've been, been dry so long, you're a fire hazard. You're not ever gonna drink again. Um, but I won't tell you that now I know differently. Um, I am a drink away from a drunk. And that's not just an abstract idea. I actually am. Uh, and every one of us has sat where you folks have sat. We've been right in your chair. We understand uh, uh, that you did not have a good year before you got here. <laughs> we, you don't have to tell us that. We've figured that out. Uh, and you're in the right place if you've got alcoholism. So thank you guys for being here and thank you, Glenn, and any, everybody involved with asking me to be here. Uh, the centerpiece of my life for the last 39 years has been sponsoring people in Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, I've been blessed with doing a lot of traveling and speaking and that sort of thing. And that's great. Uh, but, but that doesn't feed me. Uh, what feeds me is sitting one-on-one -on -one with one alcoholic and going through the only program of recovery we have, and that's the 12 steps. And seeing the light come on in their eyes and seeing the miracle happen just one more time. My home group is the Calm Down group, which I named 35 years ago when we started it because it meets on Wednesdays later on today. Um, and by back then in particular, by Wednesday, I really needed to calm down. <laughs> and, and I have a sponsor who is Bob B. from St. Paul, Minnesota. And over the next few minutes, uh, we all are gonna need some divine intervention. And um, you guys are probably gonna need it more than I do. And the first place we're gonna need it is something's gonna have to get me out of the way. And it's not gonna be me. Um, I'm not a bit more capable of getting me out of the way than I was in April of 1981. It's just way too big a job for me. And I'm also going to try to follow directions, and I've got a long and sad history with the directions. Uh, they, they've never applied to me. They've never meant what to say. And my case is different and special, of course. And I've always had a deeper understanding of things than ordinary people. Uh, I've always understood that uh, it's really conservative square johns who are always in charge of making the directions and they're usually being advised by insurance lawyers who are worse than they are and i've always understood the target audience of the directions it's morons just stone idiots so obviously these square john nerds are overstating everything to try to manipulate idiots into doing things so in my special case and by the way i've got my tongue all in my cheek here. Uh, in my special case, it's necessary without divine intervention for me to extrapolate, try to figure out what the directions really mean because they don't mean what they say. And I assure you, if I haven't done the, the 10th, 11th, and step work that I need to do today on Wednesday, I'll go right back to my default position and I'll have that same problem with the directions. Tell me that the directions are, do not exceed six in 24 hours. And without divine intervention, my brain is apt to 
really receive that as something like do not exceed 36 in 24 hours. So we're going to need some help on that. And I want to follow the uh, simple directions that we hear every time we hear or read how it works, which is in a little bit in a general way about what I was like and what happened and what I'm like now. And there's another set of directions that we don't talk about nearly as much, but it's really, really precious to me. The big book says words to the effect that our personal story is telling our own language and from our own point of view, how we've been able to form a relationship with our creator. And I really hope my story carries that because the first 37 years of my life until I got sober, I not only did not have consciously a relationship with the creator, um, I did not believe in any higher power that had anything to do with my life. I was okay with some sort of intellectual theory about a creative force, but uh, I just absolutely rejected uh, any, any thought of belief or faith. I thought people who believed and had faith were weak-minded and weak-willed. And I was more or less an evangelical agnostic. It was part of my mission to disabuse the superstitious of their superstitions. So I hope my story carries now. God turned that all around for me. I grew up on a tobacco farm uh, in southwestern Kentucky. I live in Louisville, Kentucky, by the way. Uh, and where I grew up is about 200 miles southwest, right on the Tennessee line. And I was literally born on that farm and lived there until I was old enough to run at 16. And my childhood and early life weren't a thing like I thought they were. Just no resemblance. My capacity for self-delusion is astounding. And I started to say a minute ago about the <coughs> getting the divine intervention I don't get much divine intervention on Wednesday based on what I did on Tuesday. It's truly a one day at a time thing. I don't stay sober today because of how I am. I stay sober today because of what I do today. Just like I didn't get sober because something changed in who I am or how I am. I got sober because something drastically changed in my behavior. But at any rate, um, until I got sober, I, I had this really interesting and romantic saga way past the story. Um, and, and Lord, I believed it to the point where I'd have us both crying before I got done telling it. And it was all about how by my iron will and my sterling intellect, I had pulled myself up by the bootstraps from the depths of poverty to those staggering heights I'd reached in life. I don't think I've been sober a month, a week until I realized what a load of gloom. We weren't even poor. We weren't anywhere close to poor. We were middle-class farming people, had everything we needed, most of what we wanted, and actually were better off than anybody in the community. And the staggering heights I thought I reached turned out to be a whole lot more staggering than where I am. What was really going on that 12 or 13, first 12 or 13 years is basically the same thing that's still going on after 77 years. And that's my ego disorder. The big book says the root of our troubles uh, uh, is our selfishness and self-centeredness. And that's my ego disorder. And that ego disorder has been stuck to my nose every time my eyes have come open for 77 years. And what that thing does, <clears throat> without divine intervention, it makes me so obsessed with myself. Makes me so obsessed with how, what you think of me, how I believe I'm coming across to you, uh, it makes me so obsessed with how I feel. 
that without divine intervention, I will always wind up letting how I feel be the most important thing in the world to me. And I believe that's intertwined with my ego disorder at the very bedrock of my alcoholism where it starts. That childish sociopathic demand to feel the way I want to feel, to feel better. And to let that be more important than family, more important than responsibilities, more important than health. If I'd had a relationship with God, it would have been more important than that. But uh, and all that obsession with myself, uh, as I always said, is the only effect I think it can really have on a person. It's always created so much pain and emptiness and difference and apartness down inside me that I've never been able to stand the way I feel inside without either running just as hard as I can and or stuffing something in there to make me feel good enough inside I could stand it. Now, for the last 40 years, the combination of you sweet folks who are the Fellowship of Alcoholics Anonymous and the 12 Steps, which are the only program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and the loving God that you guys were babbling about when I got here, fill up that emptiness and ease that pain and take away that apartness and that difference. And, and, and they let me be a fellow among fellows. Part of the magic of alcohol the first time for me is that without something, divine intervention or some poor substitute for God, and that's what alcohol and the things like it really always were for me. I had no idea it was that. I, I had no idea I had any need for God whatsoever. But they were a really poor substitute for God. But without something, I don't have a single peer on the face of this earth. Because of that uh, disorder of mine, uh, it makes me an egomaniac with an inferiority complex. And what I mean by that is I'm perfectly capable of feeling too good for something or someone at the same instant knowing I'm not nearly good enough for that same thing or that same person. And all my life I've known I could do anything. At the same time, I've known I couldn't really do anything. So what that means is I can't be a fellow among fellows without what is now divine intervention. Um, I'm completely alone without peers. And that's the mess I brought to my first drunk at 12, 13. And, and uh, I got in a world of trouble. I, I puked, I blacked out, I passed out, woke up next morning far sicker than I'd ever been in my life, far more terrified than I'd ever been in my life. And to swore all those Southern Baptists around the farm were wrong about every single thing else, but they were right about the booze. And I would never ever touch that crap and go through the nightmare of that first, uh, first day after again. And I was sincere and it was kind of effective because it was nearly a week until I got drunk the second time. And the way things were gonna go for the next 25 years, that was a miracle. Um, and I got drunk that second time after the horror of the first time for exactly the same reason I got drunk the other thousands of times. When I'd got enough of that booze in me for the first time in my life, it, I found something that did what I know now is a poor imitation of God, but, a, but an imitation. Of For the first time in my life, I felt good enough inside that I could stand it without running or without trying to stuff anything else in there. <clears throat> and remember that the way I feel without divine intervention is the most important thing in the world. And I don't think there was anything I was less interested in for the 25 years following my first drunk than divine intervention. <clears throat> so I don't think there's any mystery about my powerlessness over alcohol and in the latter years, the, the things like it. 
because as far as I knew, it was the only game in town. I didn't know there was anything else that could make me feel good enough inside that I could stand it. So the bottom line was sociopathically and childishly simple. When I wanted to change the way I felt, it didn't matter what it cost and it didn't matter who it cost because that's the most important thing in the world to me. And I didn't know there was any other route to it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not going to give you guys drunk law, uh, but we all have different relationships with alcohol, which brings us all to the same place if we're alcoholics. But in my case, not only alcoholism, but alcohol itself dominated my life for 25 years. Um, I'm not proud of this, but you either accepted the way I drank or you were out of my life and there was never any negotiation about that. You flat accepted it or you were gone. In fact, I think this is a pretty good partial description of a sociopath, but I don't believe for the years that I drank that I had people in my life. life. I had positions and whatever your position was in my life, I usually had your replacement interviewed at any given time because I knew the day was going to come when you called me on my drinking. And if I couldn't change your mind, you were out and gone. School was easy for me. I, I wound up despite the wild alcoholism, I wound up an early admission student in college at 16 with an academic scholarship. Uh, first uh, semester of that, I've stayed so drunk, I lost all concept of day and night, blew the scholarship. Um, then for the next seven and a half years, I worked full time, went to school full time, drank full time, and somehow got through undergraduate and law school. And I don't have a clue how that happened. Uh, I don't have uh, I don't have a handful of clear memories of that whole eight years. It's just a swirling gray mass of alcoholic insanity. Spring of 1968, I graduated from law school, passed the bar, uh, and my daughter Dana, um, who I was with yesterday morning, uh, was born. And she was my only child for the next 21 years. I have a wonderful 32-year-old son now. And I quit my job and I hung up a shingle. Here I am, self-employed criminal defense lawyer. And, um, and I practiced law for almost 10 years with quite a bit of material success. Not as much as I used to think I'd had. Uh, that's one uh, incident of staying sober a long time uh, is that we get a better view on our past. But from 40 years so, I have always had a knack of for getting involved in cases that had money and from time to time published in them. And that's what I would stick in your face when you suggested something was wrong with the way I live. And I told you how I was living up until I started practicing law. It got worse. It got a lot worse. It got worse because alcoholism simply progresses in everybody who's ever had it. Nobody dodges that bullet. It got worse because I no longer had a boss to whom I was directly responsible, looking over my shoulder. Got worse because I had some money to escalate things with. And during the latter part of that 10 years, I used a world of things other than the booze. And I used a world of them. But don't get your singleness of purpose, knickers all in a knot. Because my story is just exactly like Bill and Bob's. Everything else that I used was a side show when the booze was the big tent. Everything else I used was to have some impact on my drinking, change the effect, increase it, decrease it, help me try to function on the hangovers, but it all went back to the booze. February 10th, 1978, I'd been practicing law almost 10 years. And little law firm of 10 lawyers built up around this other fellow and myself. 
I got a little scotch vodka and four outside issues and drove a Corvette off the road at over 120 and did horrible things to my body. <clears throat> in the hospital for more than six months of the first year after the wreck, half a dozen major surgeries that first year. Altogether, on account of that wreck, I've had 15 major surgeries, the most recent one, January of last year. Um, <clears throat> I didn't get back into practice law for five years. Uh, I did not have a urinary function for over a year. The doctors told me I never would have. It was over three months before they stood me upright on an electric tilt table for the first time. And they told me I never walk without at least a brace on one leg and maybe both. It turns out the doctors were wrong about both those things. I've been sober 40 years and haven't owned a brace for over 41. And about a year after the wreck, the head of urology at Duke University did put my plumbing back together. But I didn't know that was going to happen. And after I got able to have my friends come into the hospital rooms, every single day they would come in and bring me booze and more dope than the doctors were giving me. And I would lie in that hospital bed and say really intelligent things. I would say things like, you know, fellas, anybody can stop drinking when they're going gets a little tough, but it takes a man to lay in there with it when the bills start coming in. And then I would explain to him that a man ought not be out there doing the crime if he's not prepared to do the time. So give me another drink and let's go on with it. That's insanity. It's powerlessness. And when you really think about it, it's letting the way I feel in that moment and my childish demand to change it be more important than my child, more important than my profession, more important than whether I ever walked, more important than whether I ever peed, more important than whether I lived or died. Letting the way I feel in that moment be the most important thing in this universe. And I've been convinced for a long time that after we've done step one, after we have accepted that we are in a humanly hopeless condition with regard to our alcoholism. When we put that first one in us, I believe it's the most self-centered act on this earth short of suicide because it's a conscious decision. My demand to change the way I feel right now is more important than any of it. But at any rate, um, <clears throat> I had a new wife and who had been with me when I had that break, and she had to leave me um, during the insanity that, that followed. I was in some sort of asylum at least 18 times in the two and a half years before I got sober. Um, the, the law firm had to kick me out of the law firm I had founded. Um, because of the social and legal pressure my behavior brought on them. The state of Kentucky took my law license away for the same reason, the social and legal pressure I put on the Bar Association with my behavior. Um, that new wife was staying with some girlfriends and died in an accident. I last laid eyes on my only child in January of 1980 and had absolutely no contact for over three years. For a little over a year, I lived uh, without an address. I didn't sleep on the street, but the only reason I didn't was I could always get somebody to take me in. And it was often strangers. Fall of 1980, six months before I got sober, I washed up at asylum number 17 in Nashville, Tennessee. I had assumed for two or three years I would die of alcoholism and everybody I've ever talked to who knew me during that period, including all the sweet folks who tried to 12-step me, were of the same opinion. That my ego was just too wildly out of control and I had too many grave emotional and mental disorders other than the alcoholism that I was truly the hopeless case. But I washed up that asylum number 17 in Nashville, Tennessee, and 
stayed in there about a month and it was time to get out, had no place to go. And my roommate's family lived in Nashville and those sweet folks said, why don't you come stay with us a few days? And let's try to figure out what to do with you. I wouldn't live with a year. And the first six months it didn't stay straight, but it got better and I had to get better before I could grasp anything. Just as an example, I had lost the ability to use a knife and fork on food. I'm not talking about correctly, I'm talking about effectively. And I was embarrassed to ask anybody to give me any tips on it. So we'd go to the AA meetings at the 202 Club in Nashville. And then we'd go to the Shoney's restaurant down the street. And I would sit there with my knife and fork under the table, trying to mimic what my friends were doing to get that skill back. I was just embarrassed to say, excuse me, Jimmy, boy, give me some hints on how to use these things. It seems to have eluded me. Uh, <clears throat> but it was a couple of months before I got that back. So yeah, I needed to get back. And I did. During that six months before I got sober, I went to a whole lot of AA meetings, almost all of them, 202. I got to where sometimes I could go as long as two or three weeks without getting ripped. And they only put me back in the asylum one time in that entire six month period. And the rate I've been going twice a year in the asylum looks like the picture of mental health. In late March of 81, I got on my most recent drunk. It was another one of my pop off vodka slash Listerine drunks. <clears throat> and I've drunk buckets of both those things and have better memories, by the way, of the Listerine. I can stand the smell of the Listerine today, but I can't stand the smell of that old hot cheap vodka. But on this most recent drunk, I was drinking and taking everything I could find. And by the time April 8th rolled around of 81, uh, the last day, my most recent day I drank, April 9th is my sobriety day. Um, unbeknownst to me, a loving God that I'd never acknowledged, much less asked for anything began giving me the most life-saving, life-changing gift that I've ever had in my life. And I'm so grateful that that gift has never left me. It's still with me today. And it wasn't any change in my mind. You see, I had, the last couple of years I drank, there wasn't much of me that wanted to live, but there was a little part. And that little part, knew that the only outside chance I had of living was to somehow get this AA deal you guys had. And I believe that in order to get it, it was, I had no problem step one. I had still, I knew I was in a humanly hopeless condition with my alcoholism, but I had a big problem with step two, step three, step 11, anything that mentioned God or higher power. It literally made the little hairs stand up on the back of my neck, insulted my intellect, and ran me out of the room. <clears throat> so I thought that if I were going to get AA, I had to somehow change my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs to make them more like it looked like to me you thought, felt, and believed. And as best I could in the shape I was in, I had tried, and I couldn't change a thing. So I thought it was hopeless. And my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs did not change in April of 1981. I refer to my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs affectionately as the old crazy picture show in the back of my head. Uh, <clears throat> what did change? And I didn't realize anything had changed until I looked in the rearview mirror weeks, months, years, and in some cases, decades later. What had changed was that for the very first time in my life, I began to voluntarily follow suggestions about how to run my life. Even though I didn't understand those suggestions, I didn't agree with them. I didn't think they would work, and I certainly did not want to do it. And folks, that behaving better than my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs is the only reason on earth that I'm with you guys today. Instead of having been rotting in a pauper's grave 
somewhere in Tennessee for about 40 years. By the time I got sober, once something separated me from alcohol, it was three or four days before I was physically able to do something like sit up in a chair. But somehow I shook out that most recent drunk. I had no idea why I wasn't slipping out and getting something to drink, Listerine or something to, 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 to get rid of the horrible sickness and craving. But I didn't. And about a week after that uh, most recent drunk, I stumbled and I was still badly crippled up from the wreck. I, I stumbled back to the door of that clubhouse. And I didn't expect them to let me in. Uh, I had passed out in their AA meetings and had to be bodily carried out of the club. Uh, they had caught me in their men's room with illegal outside issues. And they had warned the people they sponsored to stay away from me, that I was a loser and I was going to die. For those of you who don't know me, I'm, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a vertically challenged guy. And about two months before I got sober, I was walking through that clubhouse and a big old boy in the name of Joe, who was six five, walked up, looked way down at me and said, Don, I'm beginning to think you really are too intelligent for this program. And I thought he was giving me a compliment. My knee-jerk reaction was, well, thank God they finally figured out who they're dealing with. But Joe saved my life when he went on. And he said, and that's a shame, Don, because we have never really had anybody too dumb for the steel. And we bury you buttholes all the time. And that felt like an icy hand closing over something inside me. And I'm so grateful it's never completely gone away. You let me get a couple of stitches off the mark and whammo, I feel those tips of those icy fingers and I'm right back where I have to be in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous. I cannot fit AA into my life. And over the years, I don't see many people who do that successfully. Some people do. Some people stay sober and, and have a pretty good life fitting AA into their lives. But I have to fit my life into Alcoholics Anonymous. I have to go, I have to do that dozens of times a day. There's no big event where I fit my life into Alcoholics Anonymous and stays there. I fit it back into AA dozens of times a day. And that's what I have to do. I have to persist and I have to be in the middle of AA. <clears throat> but at any rate, they did let me in. They said, come on in, Don, you're keeping us sober. And I said, please tell me one more time what I need to do if I want to live. And they said, yeah, don't drink, don't take dope, go to meetings. Of course, I'd heard that hundreds of times. But this time, that first 60 days, I went to over 150 meetings. I had no idea why I was going. I didn't want to go to any of them. It was still clear to me that you guys were religious fanatics and that your dumb little deal of your group therapy sessions you called meetings and your myth of a higher power couldn't possibly, couldn't possibly solve my complex and unique problems. But I didn't know I had the gift. The gift was being able to turn around to my brain and say, yeah, I know, but you and I are out of options and we have nearly killed one another. So we're just going to keep going to these stupid meetings anyway. And it turned out that I had the same thing backwards about AA and that, that without divine intervention, I've had backwards every day of my life about every day. And what that is, is that in nature, I make it all about what I think, feel, and believe. In nature, if I don't feel like doing the right thing, one of the options that pops up in the old crazy picture show here is not go ahead and do the right thing anyway. The most attractive option that pops up is let's get Don fixed so he feels like doing right, so he can do right. You see, all my life, I've been absolutely convinced the difference between good people and me was they felt like doing right. 
And if we could just get me fixed so I felt like doing right, I could be good people too. Well, I've known for an awful long time those good people, and they were good people, even though they may not have wanted to do right. They may have been cussing under their breath with resentment. They may have had highly suspect motives, but they did right, and that made them good people. And despite all my grand intentions and rationalizations, I did not, and that made me bad people. And I began to have a life-saving realization, so much different from knowing, realize is a form of the word real. When I realized something, that literally means it's been brought into reality and sadness. And I began to have this life-saving realization that my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs that I have thought were everything, have now for 77 years never one time left a footprint on reality. Now, if I abdicate my behavior to my thoughts, feelings, and beliefs, that behavior leaves hideous footprints on reality. But in and of themselves, they have no power other than what I give them by acting on their orders. <clears throat> and I began to realize with them that I could behave better than I thought, felt, and believed. And that that would be the only thing that impacted reality. <clears throat> well, they told me, uh, see, I thought in order for aid work, number one, I had to believe it would work. Number two, it had to feel like it was working while it was working. And number three, I ought to be able to see the causal relationship of A calling and B. I didn't have any of those things. But at that time, getting my raggedy butt to meeting after meeting was exactly what I needed to do. They also told me that I needed to read the big book. And I told them I'd read it a few times. And they told me they knew that. I'd been quoting it to them while I was dying. They said, I, first thing I needed to get straight is the big book is not a philosophy book. There's nothing in there that I can learn or master that'll keep me sober for a heartbeat. What the big book is, is a simple instruction manual for my actions. They explained to me that I had had enough information about AA for over two years to stay sober a day at a time the rest of my life without learning one single new piece of information. They explained that what was killing me was not what I knew and didn't know. It was what I was doing and not doing. And then they explained that the action, that is the 12 steps, is the prescription for alcoholism. That it works on alcoholism precisely like an antibiotic works on an infection. If I've got an infection that's gonna kill me if it's not treated, but it will respond to antibiotics, I don't need to understand and worry myself about the origin and nature of my infection. I could learn everything there is to know about the stupid infection. And if I don't take the pills, I'm dead. What does it make what I know about the infection? I don't need to understand a single thing about how antibiotics work in the human body. I don't need to believe that they'll work. And I don't need to want to take the pills. Really, there's nothing more irrelevant than whether I want to take the pills. If I take them as directed, I'll get fine. Thank you. And they promised me that if I would take the action of the first nine steps in order to very temporarily reach a state of recovery and deflated ego, my original sponsor, for some reason, told me in my case, he expected that to last about eight seconds. I have no idea where he got the eight seconds. And then immediately jumped into doing the action day at a time. See, we don't get our daily reprieve based on our spiritual condition, thank God. Because if that's true, the days when I'd be a setting duck to get drunk, we get our daily reprieve based on the maintenance of it. And that's the difference in day and light. 
because my spiritual condition is how I am. And I have no power to immediately change that. But the maintenance of my spiritual condition is a specific set of actions that is clearly set out in the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous that I can do regardless of what the old crazy picture show in my head is saying about my spiritual condition. And if I do that, I will get my daily reprieve, not based on how I am. I will get my daily reprieve based on what I do today. But at any rate, <clears throat> they promised me that if I do those actions, that my alcoholism would be okay. And the fact that I'm here instead of the pauper's grave is pretty good evidence to me. I lived in Nashville 21 months sober. Uh, oh, they told me I also needed to get on my knees, ask and thank a power greater than myself. I remember nodding at them tearfully and thinking, well, that ain't happening. But I didn't know I had the gift. And in the latter part of April of 81, over my brain's loud veto, embarrassed even though I was by myself, I found myself getting down on my knees every morning and every night. And as far as I was concerned, talking to the wall, asking something I did not believe was there to do something I did not believe could be done, but I persisted. And I think persistence and courtesy are the two most underrated and underdiscussed of all spiritual traits. I have found it to be so in my life, but I persisted in getting down there. You see, if I'd had to wait until I intellectually believed step two, you know, step one is that we're humanly hopeless. And step two gives us some hope. Says, wait a minute, don't go jump off the bridge because even though we're humanly hopeless, we found this route through a power greater than ourselves to be okay. If I'd had to wait until I intellectually believed that, I'd have been in the pauper's grave. When I began to behave like a person would behave, if they believe step two, the twin miracles of the second step happened to me. The first one was, I immediately began to get most of the benefits of being a believer, including staying sober. And the second part of the miracle was, it turned out that for me, belief and faith are like every single thing else in my life. I've never once thought, felt, or believed my way into right action. I have had to act my way into right thinking, feeling, and believing. So as a result of taking the actions consistent with faith, I came to believe and faith found me. But I lived in Nashville the, the 21 months, unemployed, unemployable, happened at every been in my life. They led me through the fourth and fifth step. I formed a picture of what a spiritual dawn ought to look like. Where I had my own attic for that time, went back to the attic, followed directions, spent exactly an hour reviewing the first five steps. Looked like I'd done okay. So I got down on my knees, said the seventh step prayer. And believed that that was where, with God's help, I went to work on me to make me and what I decided spiritual done ought to be. And I rolled that way for the first nine years, years I'm for nine, until I was nine years old. Uh, and it was, a, it was an enchanting nine years. It's humanly impossible for a person to get from where I was in April of 81 to where God took me in that first nine years sober. Uh, <clears throat> At about a year and a half sober, it's a pure byproduct of steps eight and nine. My law license got put back in order by one measly little vote of, on, on the board of governors. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, January of 83, 21 months sober, I went back to Louisville, scared to death, to try to practice law because I couldn't find a minimum wage job in Nashville. The second month I was in town, February, they stuck me up in front of 2,000 people to talk and recorded it and began going out. And people started asking me to come here and speak and there and speak and to be their sponsor. And that same month, I saw my daughter for the first time in over three years. Two months later, she moved in with me. 
live with me throughout her high school years and she and I are just have a beautiful, beautiful friendship. Uh, <clears throat> so all those things are going great, but I'm sponsoring rooms full of people, speaking all over the country and relationships with women and financial chaos is killing me. And I didn't know what was wrong. And something happened in May of 1990, a little over 31 years ago, to cause me to look at six and seven in a completely different way. And it turned out I'd missed about all the votes. It turned out the big book doesn't say a thing about me working on myself. It talks about God removing things. And also, I didn't realize that praying for a character defect to be gone because I want it gone is the same spiritual mistake as praying to be chairman of the board of General Motors. It's a self-determined objective because the seventh step prayer doesn't ask God to remove all the defects of character. It asks God only to remove the ones that stand in the way of my usefulness to God and my fellows. And that's not just six or seven. That is the backbone of the program. Early on, page 20, it tells us that our very lives as ex-problem drinkers depend upon the constant thought of others and how we may best help them. Third step prayer, take away my difficulties. Not so I can be sober and spiritual and happy, but the victory of them bear witness to those I would help of God's power, love, and way of life. Steps eight and nine, all practical, put our lives in order. Look on 77. Says, yeah, we're doing that. That's not our real purpose. Our real purpose is to fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and those around us. And I have stumbled that way for the last 31 years. Hadn't been a day when I thought I did it well enough that it would have done any good, but I persisted. And I found out that in carrying the message in all of my human relationships from the most intimate to the most casual and fleeting, courtesy, courtesy, unfailing courtesy is so important. If I'm always courteous, I'm a long way down the road to seeking to love, comfort, and understand others rather than demanding that they love, comfort, and understand me. Uh, and I've come to the conclusion that it's absolutely impossible to be discourteous and spiritual at the same time. And what God's done with my life in the last 31 years is even more of a miracle than the first nine years. Even though I felt like I did it so poorly, I have persisted. And if in May of 1990, in nine years so, I'd made a list of the best I thought it was possible for me to have in every area of life, please believe me, I would have shortchanged myself in every area of my life, material, spiritual, everything. When I'm willing to behave like a person would behave, when they're not trying to take care of themselves, they're trying to help God's kids do what they need to have done. God takes my life to places that I don't believe. Thank you all. I love you and I really appreciate being with you today. God bless.